Blog Talk Radio. Songs of Salah here on 17 Numa Radio. I'm your host, Scott Thomas Outler, and I want to thank everyone for tuning in this evening. It is Saturday, May the 11th, 2019. That means that tomorrow is the 12th, which happens to be Mother's Day. So I wanted to take a moment and say Happy Mother's Day to my mom, my sister, my aunts, and any other mothers who might happen to be listening to this. Hope that everyone has a peaceful, wonderful weekend spent with family and those they love the most. I'm looking forward to tonight's episode. I'm going to be joined by poet Jason Roddenbeck coming up in the next segment. I met Jason earlier this year in January at an event called A Novel Idea that we were both featured readers at. That's hosted by Beth Becker Hermes every month in the Atlanta area. Enjoyed listening to Jason's poems that evening, and so looking forward to speaking with him more about his work tonight and hearing some more of those poems from his book, Finding Peace in My Life. So that's coming up shortly. On the note of Atlanta events, I did want to mention briefly here at the top that there have been a couple I attended this week. On Thursday, I had an opportunity to read at the beautiful Callenwold Fine Arts Center in Atlanta, at an event hosted by Ruth Wyndham, and then the following day on Friday, I attended the monthly Phoenix and Dragon Bookstore event in Sandy Springs, Georgia, hosted by Michael Burke. Audio from both of those readings is available now on my YouTube channel. Michael Burke, Ruth Wyndham, and Beth Becker Hermes that I mentioned a moment ago have all been past guests here on Songs of Salah. There is an archive available on 17 Numa Radio for anyone who might be interested in listening to those previous interviews. I do also encourage anyone listening to please subscribe to 17 Numa Radio and help spread the word. It's easy, quick, and free. Just click on the follow button found above the slideshow here on the channel where the episode is streaming. And that will get you in the loop and set up to receive notifications for all the great guests that are coming up on future episodes. There is also an archive available at my website, 17numa.com. If there's anyone interested in appearing as a future guest on the program, you can get in touch with me at 17numa at gmail.com or look me up on Facebook Twitter or Instagram and send me a message there. I'm always looking to talk to poets and novelists, musicians, artists of all sort. Anyone who has their song to sing is welcome to come on the program and do just that. So please reach out to me if that's something you might be interested in. And on the note of future episodes, I wanted to mention that coming up on Wednesday, May the 15th, I'm going to have a friend Uh, poet and artist Misty Milwee joining the program to talk about her work. She also happens to be the cover artist for my most recent collection of Sand and Sugar, which was just released a few short weeks ago in April through a publisher out of India called Cyber Wit. So copies of that book are available through the publisher and on Amazon. I also have some personal copies on hand if there's anyone who would like to order directly Through me, you can get in touch with me 
at any of those venues that I mentioned earlier, easiest of which is probably through Gmail at 17numa at gmail.com. I also have an episode coming up next Friday on May the 17th. Poet Beth Gordon is going to be appearing that night to talk about her new book from Animal Heart Press. And then in the second hour of that episode, we're going to have the next segment of the open mic here on the program. Those are always a blast, so if there's anyone who might want to call in and read a few poems of their own, talk about any current projects they have going on, you're more than welcome to do that. That show starts at 9 p.m. Eastern on Friday. So I hope everyone's weekend is off to a great start so far. Mine began on a bit of a tumultuous note earlier this afternoon. It was at my favorite park, walking along, bebopping a bit absentmindedly before I realized that just a couple of feet in front of me It was a nice-sized water moccasin chilling out on the trail, so I came to a screeching halt, threw things into reverse, and found an alternate path. And that's cool. Sometimes in life, we have to reverse course and head toward greener pastures, and so I did just that. And now things are flowing a bit more smoothly. The night is going along well, and I hope yours is also, my friends. So, going to go to a music break here, and then coming back on the other side, we'll be joined by tonight's guest, Jason Roddenbeck. Stay tuned, and enjoy.
right, welcome back to Songs of Salah. That was Life Going By by King's X. And without further ado, I want to read the bio and bring on tonight's guest. Jason Roddenbeck is an Indiana-born former minister and college teacher who currently works at a private university. He is passionate about his wife, Vanjie, theology, learning, and pipe tobacco. On weekends, he and Vanjie love to go exploring small towns, parks, and antique shops. They find beauty in old things and love to restore and repurpose them. You can see some of their creations and buy his poetry book at theroadinback.com. So, Jason, thanks for joining the program this evening. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you, Scott? Ah, doing very well. Thanks. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, looking forward to it. So I guess we could dive in from the beginning maybe and talk a little bit about it says here that you were born in Indiana. How long did you live there and what ultimately got you down south here in Georgia? Well, uh, my dad um, was a preacher, actually, and um, we moved all over the country. And uh, by the time I was in high school, I had lived in four different states, and um, we were hither and yon, and we ended up uh, back in Indiana, and I kind of spent my uh, 20s there and um, got married and ended up going to off to college uh, as a non-traditional student in Missouri. Um, found work down here in Georgia as a minister and uh, didn't go terribly well. Um, my uh, my first wife and I uh, divorced and um, I, while I was teaching adjunct at a small college uh, here in Atlanta, and um, we've been, uh, I remarried, and we've been um, out to Idaho and then back. I, don't, I can't really even count the number of times I've moved, but um, <laughs> but uh, now I'm here, and I kind of consider uh, Powder Springs home. So, yeah, I guess that's... Um, uh, not as interesting as I thought it might be, but uh, it's uh, it, it's kind of where I am. So moving around so much growing up and then a few times during your adult life as well, how how is that experience and is it something that you still like to do? Do you travel or do you have settled roots here now in Georgia? You know, um, I, I – I think when I was growing up, I really resented moving around um, primarily because you, you you end up going to new places and the people that you meet have um, a history with each other. And so you're always sort of uh, kind of an outsider. And um, I kind of learned after so many moves to enjoy that. And I think that's part of my uh, kind of obsession with being from Indiana. Um, a lot of my family is back in Indiana, and I and I love being able to say I'm from Indiana and to be in these different places and to sort of be the person who has a sort of outsider perspective. And so um, I think I think a part of me kind of grew up loving that. Uh, resenting it for a while and then loving the idea of being from somewhere else and going and exploring new places. But I think as, uh, as I got into my forties and started to look back and, and some of the, uh, the writers and, and some of the thinkers that I have become uh, uh, enamored with have kind of convinced me that there's, there's a, a value to being rooted in a place and getting to know that place and becoming a part of that place. And um, I think when I married Vanjie and, and we had, we, we had an opportunity to move out to Idaho for a while and it, it things didn't go that well there. And I remember um, she didn't uh, m- moving across country seemed really uprooting for her and for her son, Noah and it was incredibly difficult. And I remember thinking, goodness, well, I've done this dozens of times, you know, uh, this is no big deal. 
um, looking back, uh, I, I think now I'm a little jealous um, of not feeling as rooted as they did. And so um, I've spent uh, the last uh, few years since we've been back here in Georgia trying to um, trying to learn the place and to feel at home and to feel rooted and and a part of a place. I'm I'm um, I'm a big fan of Wendell Berry's work, and one of the uh, central concepts in his work is the idea of membership or a kind of belonging to to place and community and um and staying there and, and um investing yourself in the place and in the community and that's something that um was uh, never a part of my childhood and even a, a great part of my adulthood but has been a recent um a, a recent interest and passion of mine that's interesting because you talk about your father being involved in the ministry and it would seem that being a part of a church would seem like a community, but then it's juxtaposed with the fact that you're moving around so often. So now that you are here in Georgia, are you still part of the ministry and how does uh, being with other people of faith play into that idea of community that you're talking about? <sighs> Um, yeah, you know, one would think that being involved in the church would get, would be a, um, uh, would naturally sort of include that sense of community. And I think if it's done well and done in a healthy way, that that is, that's actually, that's the main point of being involved in the church. Um, that said, um, I, I don't find, and, and without, without diving too much into um, religion, um, I don't find that a lot, of, a lot of things that call themselves church um, are quite as, as great at doing community as they should be. And... Um, and I, I should also probably uh, throw some of the blame, I guess, at our own brokenness. My father um, um, had uh, quite a few. I, I believe, in retrospect, my father was mentally ill, and um, was always trying to find a sense of self um, worth and value in the ministry, and um, and. and uh, I guess a few years ago um, there was an article that came out and it was in, I think it was in psychology today and also in uh, some of the big business uh, newspapers, wall street, not the wall street journal, um, a couple of different uh, newspapers. And um, it, it, it was uh, one of those kind of clickbait kind of articles, but it said, these are the 10, um, the 10 careers that attract the most sociopaths and ministry was number seven or eight, uh, I, I think. And so um, what ends up happening, I think is a lot of folks go into these kind of positions because they want to feel a certain way about themselves. They want to feel like they matter and they want to feel like they have made a difference. And unfortunately, it's just not the best reason to get into it. It's a a better reason is that you love people and you want to uh, you want to help and you want to um, you want to share. Unfortunately, um, if you go into it with the wrong motive and you you end up in some of the wrong places, then you end up moving around quite a bit and you never really end up having the kind of healthy relationships that I think the religion is intended to create. And um, for that reason, uh, my experience ended up being very negative. That I went into it again later um, when I had had such a negative experience as a child, uh, watching my father preach and, and us moving around so much. 
um, that is kind of a wonder in itself. I had kind of sworn off the idea of ever doing that, um, but I think I ended up going into it for very similar reasons, if if I was going to be honest. There is always that risk of any sort of culture, whether it be religious or political or any group of being in a position of power and how that can inherently corrupt human beings. We're warned about that in the Bible itself. And so something to look out for, but I think you hit it on the nail there about the service oriented true meaning behind the church and people giving back to the community and spreading love basically um, at the core idea of it all and the word. So Mm. what was, You know, you talk about getting back into it possibly for similar reasons. Did you have an epiphany at some point that brought you out of that sort of mindset? You know, um, I, uh, um, yeah, when when I was married to my first wife, I I floated uh, a, a while. Um, I was not a very, um, a very happy, uh, teenager, didn't really have very very much focus. Didn't go to school uh, right out of high school. Um, floated and kind of uh, had some dead end jobs. Um, there were some jobs that I had that that probably could have been a decent career, but I just couldn't really get into them. Um, I I, I kind of became convinced um, around 26 or 27 that that ministry might be the only thing I could do well. And um, and so I thought, well, I'll I'll go ahead and try this. By this time, I was married and had a couple of children, so I uprooted them. And very similar to what happened with my father, um, we uh, I uprooted my family and we we went out to uh, to to Missouri to a little um, Bible college out there, and I went to school. And it was a very conservative school. I grew up in a very conservative family um, with very conservative assumptions. And I think it was um, it was after going to school and then and then working for that school, and then going on to seminary, that I began to really question uh, m- my understanding of of God, uh, who God is, and what the whole purpose of of our faith was. That our faith wasn't primarily about um, about God becoming a human so he could get knocked around and punished so that we could escape from this place. Um, But that our faith was about um, God wanting to reinstate a better, a better humanity and a better type of people. And what, what uh, Jesus said was a kingdom a kingdom of people who recognized a different way of life and a different way of thinking and a different way of living that was primarily peaceful, nonviolent, justice-oriented, seeking to love um, rather than to uh, gain, seeking um, seeking to restore what had been created. Um, that was no longer functioning properly. And once I started thinking that way, um, I found myself kind of at odds um, with a lot of of religion. And one of the word the word that I think you just used a few minutes ago, Scott, that that hits the nail on the head is power. And that um, uh, we I, I I came to see that what we're really being called to in, in my faith is to abandon the idea of trying to get power over people and to humble ourselves and be willing to die, uh, to die to ourselves, to to give up power in order to serve and care for each other. And that is a, it's not a very popular way of looking at it, and yet I think it is ideally. I, I think it's what has the ability to change, to actually make changes, and and to make things better. 
Well said. And I was thinking just now, I was reading through several of the poems in your book earlier today, getting ready for this interview, and one of the lines just jumped back out at me as you were talking about that, where you, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's about not wearing a cross, but carrying your own cross. And that idea, at least what it meant to me, of taking that inherent suffering that's in this world upon ourselves the same way that Jesus did and not lamenting over it, but understanding that realizing that there is suffering in this world opens up the blessings for the joy of life and that space of unconditional love where we can share it with the community and with other people. And uh, that aspect well, that, seems deeply rooted right. to me. That that really is the the core of of what my wife and I, my wife Angie and I have, um, and and several uh, uh, friends and some of the people that that I look up to. I think we we've, we've sort of tried to capture that exact idea that the story in the Gospels isn't of a guy coming to get beaten up so that we don't have to. Um, but that he came to identify with the kind of suffering we endured. Suffering is a central part of what it means to be a human. I mean, that's where where we are. So we live in a world in which suffering is a, a huge part. And so much of what we do, I think, as poets and as writers, as thinkers, as artists, as people who are trying to deal with the problems that, that we suffer with as, as humans, we are trying to we're trying to wrestle with the problem of pain and suffering and the story of the gospels is that so does God and God does that by coming and suffering with us and saying not that I'm doing this so you don't have to but saying I'm doing this come and do it with me and so much of the injustice I think that we see in our culture and politically and um, uh, socially, the sort of social structures we have, money and uh, economics, oh, so much of it is trying to get power and use power in order to try to reduce our own suffering, but always at the cost of someone else. And um, that means that everyone else is always the other, everyone else is always the the person we have to sort of uh, compete with and um, rather than this person is a brother or sister that um, that I am a part of and that I belong to and that we belong together as a community and so that's a, a huge part of that's a huge part of our thinking and I, I think that hopefully comes across in some of the poems I've I've tried to write I think it absolutely does from what I was reading earlier today and maybe we can move in and start talking a little bit about your poetry now and how that came about. Has it been something that you've always been interested in or what was the key moment that turned you on to art and poetry? I am. Um, I, I, when I was um, a, a child, I had always enjoyed art uh, I I could draw um, fairly well. I mean, not exceptionally well, but um, I could usually sit down and draw something out. And I studied art in high school. I studied art a little bit when I was in college in Indianapolis. And I, I thought sometimes about doing that, but I was always intimidated by it because I could always see, I would always see students who were just wonderful artists. And I found it, um, um, I found it intimidating. And so um, I, 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 if I couldn't do art, I, I was also impressed by books, and I wanted to write, and I do love writing. Um, I love writing essays, and I love writing poems. I think, um, I think even in my 20s, I sort of dabbled with poetry, even though I didn't read many poets. Um, it wasn't until in my 30s and 40s that I started to develop an appreciation for poems and for different poets, and um, and started to um, 
and started to explore um, poetry as a as a way of saying something that gets across. Um, some of the, I mean, a lot of the Bible is obviously poetry, and um, the prophets um, added a lot of poetry in their work. And so, I think what happened uh, really is in my 40s, I started to sort of turn to it because um, I had found it so frustrating to try and get out any kind of message otherwise that I thought was important. And uh, and suddenly I found that I could write a poem and some of my friends would read it when they might not read an essay that I was really excited about. Um, because a poem, I think... Um, speaks to people on a more visceral level. Um, and I, I, I suppose that maybe one of the reasons why in our scriptures that that's why so often people turn to poetry. I think the first one I wrote um, where I started to think, man, I, I think I could really enjoy writing poetry was a poem that's in the book. It's just a silly poem about black ice. And um, I was trying to drive to work and everybody was off the roads because there was a black ice scare and um, was the only one out and I was feeling self-righteous because I'm from the north and nobody in Georgia wanted to be out on the roads and I wrote this, I wrote this poem and a, one of my friends who is a Georgia native who just, um, just was, uh, got out of uh, open heart surgery a few weeks ago um, uh, his first uh, response was, "You get us. You really understand us." And um, and it just made me laugh that he wasn't offended by the poem, but he actually appreciated it. And I thought, you know, there might be something to this. So I started um, writing more. And then when um, I met Vanji and we started to date um, after my divorce, um, I found that it was a, a great way to express what I was feeling about her. She told me that I was supposed to refer to her as my muse tonight. And, um, but I suppose that that's true that she really is my muse. Um, I don't, I've never had a muse before. So, um, but yeah, uh, I think that that was, um, I think I started to appreciate it. And I, 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 I think I like writing poetry more than I like writing anything else anymore. Um, it's just a way to express myself. There is something about it that is more poignant and gets straight to the essence of a subject, sort of captures that snapshot in time that people can relate to, it seems. I certainly understand what you're talking about on that level. And every poet should have a muse, so it's great that you found yours, and I know that uh, section of the book is dedicated to your wife, or the book itself is dedicated to your wife, and um, maybe talk a little bit about the process of when you decided to put the book together and how that came about and your decisions on how you were going to uh, frame the book. Yeah, um, I, I was doing a lot of writing, and I and I published a blog um, where I write was writing different things that I would share. Some of them were uh, opinion pieces. Some of them were kind of research pieces, and and I started to actually put some of my poems on it. Um, I didn't put everything on it. Um, frequently, um, I'll write something, and I'll think it's a great idea when I write it, and then um, I, I, I won't be – I'll have trouble finishing it and go back to it later and think, oh, this is terrible. I don't like this at all. Um, and then, you know, the opposite can happen as well where you think something's just – Really, you're really struggling, and then later you come back to it and you think, "Oh, I, I, this was really good." So I would publish some on my blog, and I would not publish others. Some of the ones I wrote to my wife never made it to the blog, and um, they were just uh, on a piece of paper around here. And then some, uh, some did. Um, and then uh, I, I had always wanted to to publish a book. Um, and uh, uh, I, but I had kind of given up on the idea. It, you know, it's very difficult to, obviously, very difficult to get published. And a lot of uh, what I had t 
tried to do in my life, um, going off to school, becoming a minister, starting to teach. Um, I was going to go do a Ph.D. because my, my goal was to put together a book. I wanted to write a book. Um, and all that kind of fell apart at, at, uh, at one point. And so after a few years of writing and publishing poems, uh, my friend Chris, uh, Chris Graves, whose pictures are in, are in the book, was encouraging me. She knew uh, Beth uh, Hermes and was doing a class with her. And um, Chris just started encouraging me, and, and I owe a lot to her. Um, she was just, um, and her husband, John, and her kids, um, they're good friends of our family, even though they, they moved uh, out west um, last year. But she would, um, and there's a poem in here that's dedicated to her, where she just said, um, you know, I'll, uh, when are you going to do a book? And I said, well, I just have given up on that dream. And she said, well, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just hold the dream for you. And it was a, a moving moment for me. And finally I said, you know, maybe I'll put some of these poems together. Would you let me use some of your pictures? Because then maybe some of my friends who've already read all these, they'll have something else to look at. And she just p- takes these wonderful pictures. She has a way of of taking a picture and it captures a, a moment or a memory. And um, she just, it's an art and she let me use them for free. And so we just, I, I, she let me have a bunch of those pictures and I took them and my wife and I sat down and we went through these poems and said, well, I don't, I said, I don't like these ones anymore. And um, she found ones that she liked and, and we just kind of threw them together and tried to place them with the right image. And um, we self-published it. Um, and it was a lot of fun. And then I finally ended up with a, so I finally wrote a book <laughs> and it was, um, it was satisfying. And I'm, I'm actually been, I've been working on another. Um, I've had a little success getting around and talking about it. It's been kind of fun. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, that was kind of the way the process went. And along the way, we, we ended up looking at a lot of them and I rewrote a few of them and changed a lot of stuff that I didn't like about some of the ones that, need a little tweaking, but um, that's what I ended up with. That was kind of my process. Wonderful. I'm glad that you brought up Chris Graves, um, a mutual friend of ours, and I was reading through the book today and noticed that opposite your poem, Irony, in here is a photograph of the bicycle stuck in the tree, and I actually have that same print here framed in my room where I do this show from so I thought that was pretty cool and got to see Chris out in Portland a couple of months ago when I was out there for the AWP conference had dinner with her and her husband and we talked about your book a a little bit during that conversation as well and so that's wonderful I haven't talked to them in a while Um, they were they are very uh, dear friends of ours great I'm going to uh if she's not listening right now, I'm going to send her the link to this episode once it gets archived so she can hear you talking about your work here tonight. And um, What's the process and how far along are you in it with the next book that you were talking about? Um, well, I've, uh, I've had a, a, a kind of a um, – I've had a little luck in that in that uh, a, a friend of mine invited me to be a part of a of a group where we kind of challenge each other to keep writing. Um, you know, uh, when you're when you're a writer and you you enjoy writing and you you love expressing yourself, but you you have to kind of find time to do it because of work and other projects and everything. Uh, it, sometimes it helps to have folks who sort of come along and, and give you a challenge. And Chris has done that for me a couple of times, just send me a picture and say, write a poem about this. But uh, my friend Brian Smith um, invited me to a group, and, and it's actually given me a lot of uh, inspiration to to keep writing. 
and um, and so I'm I'm producing things a lot m- a lot more often now. Um, some of them I some of them I'm just trying to crank out to meet a challenge for a week. Some of them um, uh, aren't quite as good, and I go back to and I keep working on it. Um, I've I've probably got 20 or 30 different poems that I'm kind of thinking about um, putting together in another collection. Um, some of them I've put on my blog, others I haven't. I'm working on another piece that um, is a little longer and that is is going to be about um, the breakup of family and um, what that's what that's all about. And I've got some experience with that. Um, so uh, kind of I'm in an early stage of of putting together a lot of different things. I, I can't say that I've got, you know, a central theme. Um, it's kind of disparate right now. Uh, but I just know that I'm, I'm, I've had a lot of, um, I've just had a lot of energy and, and it's sort of coming out. So I think I'm going to put it all together again. That's awesome. When that creative energy is flowing, you just got to let it spill over as long as that, uh, vein is running, and you mentioned a moment ago about the balance between work and personal life and writing, and so how do you find time to write? Do you have a scheduled time that you do it, or is it just when inspiration hits and you are able to sit down? Well, you know what's funny is um, that I, I frequently, inspiration hits when I'm nowhere near anything to write with. Um, the uh, I I write a lot with a keyboard. I, I although some of my uh, influences are more more apt to write with pencil and paper, but I tend to think better at keys. And um, I, I you know if you live in Atlanta, I'm sure you I'm sure you can identify with this. You're going to spend a lot of time in your car, and um, I frequently find myself coming up with a thought or a a lot of times a poem for me begins with just a couple of words that capture a feeling or a a picture or a moment um, really well. And then I'm trying to scramble to find some way to capture that uh, so that I don't forget it by the time I get to my office or by the time I get home. Um, and try to scrawl something down. Uh, and then sometimes that, again, will turn into something, and sometimes it won't. Um, but, you know, I, I I have a little time a lot of times before my work day starts when there's no one else in the office, and um, my wife and I have both just driven to work, and I come, uh, I sit down, and I I have 20 minutes or so to just sort of pour out whatever's in, whatever's uh, there. And then sometimes um, I'll be out just walking and, and find, um, find something that strikes me and, and I'll, and I'll write that down. So I, I guess I'm blessed. I have a job that will allow me to take a few minutes here or there to scroll something down. Some folks, um, may not have that luxury um yeah what type of work do you do at the university i work for a a university called life university and um i'm an instructional designer Um, when i was teaching at a small christian school um in atlanta i um i kind of picked up the skill of being able to um design online instructional content and assessments. And so that opened up a, uh, uh, a kind of um, career, I suppose, for me where I could, uh, um, I could sort of do that for a living um, vocation, I guess. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of like putting together puzzles. Um, it's basically like building websites for, for classes is what it really ends up being. Um, 
but uh yeah and so it it's a uh, it's kind of a way to be creative without using up all the creative energy that I might need to write something that's really important to me so it's it's kind of good because I have to think graphically and and try to find ways to take uh an instructor's language and turn it into structure um and so it's it's kind of retro engineering. A lot of times what I feel like I'm doing when I'm writing poetry is taking a structure, an image, an idea, and trying to find language for it. Um, whereas, um, you know, like I said a minute ago, what you're doing with, with instruction, you, you have a content expert that really knows, I don't know, biochemistry, but they don't understand how to put it together in a, in a course. So I take their language and try to help them find a structure for it. Um, yeah, I guess that, that makes – hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, sort of the duality, You working on both sides of that equation and finding that overall balance uh, with those two spheres of your life. And talking about the creative energy, does that play in also with what you talked about here in your bio of doing the repurposing – and restructuring of antiques and items of that nature. Yeah, that is um what one thing that um that we feel I think that has been kind of a, a way of expressing um our idea about what we think um the gospel is supposed to be about, which is taking things that taking people or a world that has uh, been misused and and finding beauty that's in it and restoring it or re repurposing it. So I wrote a poem uh, some time ago that's uh, that's actually on my blog right now called "I Am a Palette." I usually I like to work with pallet wood where I find old oak pallets and I take them apart and I make new things out of them. And um, I try to – when I do it, I try to find ways to keep the, uh, keep the scars and to keep the, the marks from the use of the palette uh, because that's part of the story of this piece of wood that had once been a tree and then somebody used it to move plastic junk, right? And, um, and it got – set out in the rain, it got put down in the dirt, it's been skidded across floors and thrown here and there, and um, after so many years, it's just been beaten up, and now it's just an old piece of wood that is just going to be burned. And um, so I can find this and, and take it apart and and make something new out of it, and if you just sand off some of the dirt and sand down some to some of the splinters and you can usually find that it's actually a beautiful piece of wood and it's more than a beautiful piece of wood it's got a story and it's been it's got some scars and some nail holes in it and um but then it's got it can have a whole new life it can be restored and turned into something that's useful and beautiful and i i feel that way about our lives that um my wife and i both um, came from very abusive backgrounds, and um, you know we kind of feel this way that we've kind of been used up, and now we have been restored and we're being used to do something new. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, doing that with the road and back, and some just trying to. Uh, take old things and, and do something new with them. It's been a, it's not just been a creative thing. It's been a restorative thing for us, a rejuvenating thing for us. It makes us feel hopeful. That's really a great philosophy to be able to find the value in older items and the history behind them, especially in this modern culture that is, so immediate into gratification and all the electronics are so temporary and turning over at such a rapid pace to be able to have that meditation on honoring the past and 
the craftsmanship that went in to those items that are still around and then being able to, as you just said, rejuvenate them. I like that a lot, especially as it ties into your personal life too. It's great to pull all that together. Um, we got about 10 minutes left here in the show and I was wondering if you might like to read some selections from your book tonight, maybe talk about a couple of the poems. Sure. Um, I was, uh, yeah, I think, um, this is one that, um, it, it kind of ties into that. Um, I called this, this poem, The Restoration of All Things. And uh, I think one of the, one of the things that is um, an interest of me and Vanji is we, uh, we spend a lot of time sitting out on our back porch um, and we tend to eat dinner out there and watch the birds in the evenings, especially in the spring and the summer. And um, this poem came to me, um, I think, during the last presidential election when I was very discouraged. And um, I called, again, I called this the restoration of all things. At times I feel like a poet with no words, a builder without nails or boards, a composer without notes or measures, yet being compelled to write. At other times, I am like a painter staring at a blank canvas and holding a palette of brilliant colors, but having no subject in mind. I begin to wonder whether paints and notes even matter, whether putting words together in ways which reveal the truth can break through the arrogant certainty of a people clamoring for security and power at the cost of the most vulnerable, refugee, undocumented child, poor, sick, disabled, foreigner, the other. It is a terrible thing. Terrible to watch the public once again turn as to a Messiah, to the pursuit of profit above all else, economic growth at the cost of the land, the streams, the fish and birds, the creatures and the trees. Terrible to know the crushing weight of debts unpaid, the sense that at any moment those masters of finance may take from us what little we have to add to their wealth. Terrible to realize the world's incapacity to imagine an alternative to bombs and bullets, though an alternative has already been given to them. To be obliged to speak, but to lack the conviction that it matters, is a special kind of misery. But then I watch the hairy woodpecker chipping away at the suet. I listen to the house finch and the nuthatch calling to their mates. I see the pair of mourning doves perched together on the branch and, and moved by their low warbling coos, their unwillingness to leave one another's side. I catch a glimpse of the red fox nimbly darting through the brush, a red ghost. I hold the bleeding newborn kid, her tiny hooves already able to leap. I see the dogwood budding its snow-white blooms while the squirrels scurry and jump in her branches. They are not dismayed. They live and die by trust that the earth will produce its fruits, that the air will support their wings, that the ground beneath them will be firm, that the keeper will be faithful. They live and die by trust, finding their joy in being what they are and living in the moment, loving what is before them and accepting the harshness of this world, as Paul said, groaning in birth pangs, while waiting for the restoration of all things. Fantastic message in that piece. Thank you. Um, how, how much time do we have? We have about five minutes left, if you want to read a couple more. Okay. Um, I was thinking that I, would, I might read um, this one. Uh, this one is uh, a piece I wrote uh, on Wendell Berry's birthday. Wendell is, I think, probably uh, the poet who has had the biggest impact on me, and uh, not just on poetry, but uh, on my way of thinking and looking at the world and on at, at being a part of uh, uh, belonging in community and, and membership. 
for Wendell on his birthday. Sometimes I just haven't got the heart to read or write. I sit down with pen or book, and my mind is overtaken by the darkness of the news, by hate and violence all around us. Sometimes I'm overcome by the stress of wondering why the bills are bigger than the paychecks and why bullies are so strong and why it has to be so lonely to be here. And then I realize that there are better people than I who have been through worse. It is at those times that I most appreciate Brother Wendell calling the mosquito holy. I remember this as my wife and I watched the brown bats flutter madly through the waning evening sun as the muggy Georgia day becomes the sultry Georgia night, while the locusts and the katydids and the tree frogs fill the air with their raucous melodies and psalms, calling to their beloveds, come to me from the kudzu. And the rightly named lightning bugs flash and hover over the green grass. With a sweaty beer in my hand, I draw a puff of smoke from my pipe. And for the moment, I can forget the problems we broken men have created in our endeavor to make the world better. Sitting in the evening with my bride, the hardship and complexity, the indefensibleness and unsustainability of our bully economy gives way to the simplicity and symbiosis of the earth. And I am reminded that God is in his heaven and that heaven is here all around us. And I am at peace. Very nice. Another with that message of rebalancing with nature and finding that spiritual place of inner peace. I dig it. I think we got time for maybe one more, if you'd like. Okay, um, this one I call I called I have learned to love growing things. I have learned to love growing things. Once I plucked the blooms and tore the leaves, tossing them aside, I have learned to meet them in their tenderness, to care for them gently, to learn their names, and to speak them with kindness. Growing things are a blessing, vulnerable in their station. They nourish the earth and replenish it. They make their place a garden. We were made to be gardeners. I have learned to love the soil, to reach my hands into its heart, to find within its cool darkness the source and sustenance of all things. I love the creatures who dig and tunnel within it, who feed and nurture it, who contribute to it. Once I thought it was merely dirt. I have found commonness with the clay and the loam. We are made of this. We will return to it. I have learned to love the beasts, those which crawl, swim, run, and hop, which creep and fly and slither. I have held all manner in my hands and felt their breath and looked into their eyes. I have seen within them the force of life, how they do what they are made to do, how they seem to find joy in doing it. I have learned to love the night, to take comfort in the sounds of blue darkness, the loud chirping of the frogs and crickets. I have been to places of such blackness that the dust gives way to indescribable beauty, The galaxy appears in grandeur. I have learned to love the stars, to feel their cold light and contemplate smallness, to see in them the source of matter. The planets are formed by their cycles. I have learned to love the stones, creek pebbles and mountain boulders, shale and pumice, granite and sandstone, limestone and quartz. Their story is measured in millennia and eras, billions of years. I have learned to love the waters, brackish and fresh, rivers and lakes, oceans and seas. I have learned to love its clearness, to love its freeness, its untamed drive, to break its bonds, to push out, to escape, to flow. The enlightened look around to find a world full of resources and possessions. They see supplies and assets to use as they chase their own godhood, as they strive to be creators. I, however, am learning to find myself a part of this place, to know myself as a creature among creatures, as a child of the dust and the stars, made of water and soil, and bound to this world. Very nice. Great piece to end on there. I think we just cut in a little bit into the archive here, so anyone that was listening live might have got the last couple of seconds cut off, but anyone who listens to this in the future will be able to catch the full show So I want to thank everyone for tuning in, and I want to thank you, Jason, for appearing tonight. It's been a 
great conversation with you. I uh, really enjoyed learning more about your life and maybe just mention where people can go to find out more about your work, your blog, and where they could pick up a copy of your book. Sure. Um, you can go to uh, Jason Rodenbeck at uh, jasonrodenbeck.wordpress.com um, or uh, theroadinback.com. Um, I'm also involved in a, a ministry called forgingplowshares.org where some of my writing is there, but also some of uh, my friends, and um, that's uh, hopefully where you can go to, to find that stuff. Okay, great. Encourage everyone to go check out those sites. And once again, thanks for coming on tonight. Hope you have a great rest of the weekend, Jason. Thank you so much, Scott. It's been an honor. All right. Take care. Take care. All right. One for tuning in here tonight. And once again, please do subscribe to 17 Numa Radio and sign up for future guest next episode Wednesday May the 15th with Misty Milwee and until then hope everyone has a great Mother's Day tomorrow and enjoy the rest of your weekends Salah